uh, thank you all for coming. It's so great to have you here. And um, let's start with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, I thank you for uh, just the gift of your church, uh, the gift of the city of Rome, uh, and the grace of being able to go on pilgrimage. I just ask you through this talk to be able to uh, overflow those graces to others, uh, to be able to share all the wonderful things you did through this trip. And uh, I ask that you bless my words, that they would be of you, and that uh, our hearts would be open to receive from your Holy Spirit. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so this is just a long answer to the question, how was your Rome pilgrimage? So, uh, it, so I just got back on March 10th and uh, put together some pictures. And there's a little bit of history um, and then some of the spiritual experience as well. Um, so for a lot more, you can also check out uh, the, our blog website. So some of our seminarians put together a blog. And that has a like day by day what we did each day. So this is more of a synthesis of just the experience as a whole. Um, I really wanted to start out with the question of why do a pilgrimage? You know, like what is a pilgrimage? Um, and for me, um, <clears throat> so just a little background. Uh, so I I became Catholic in 2017, and um, I had been to Rome once before in 2011. You know, just for three days with my family. And so a lot of the trip, I was kind of thinking back to my previous experience of Rome as a Protestant. And then now is my first time there as a Catholic. Um, and so there's some links there. Um, but then also in 2014, uh, I was very blessed to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And it, I guess it wasn't technically a pilgrimage, but it was with a Jewish advocacy group in college. and they um yeah they was like we we visited jerusalem and i didn't know the catholic idea of pilgrimage i didn't really have that concept yet but i really experienced it in the trip because uh there was one moment um we were walking the actual stations of the cross the via dolorosa in jerusalem and uh i i didn't even know what the stations of the cross were i was like why are the the numbers at each station like what is this um and our tour guide, she asked me at this station, the fifth station, when Jesus falls the second time, that uh, I was in the front of the group. So she told me to tell everyone else in the group as they walked by, like, this is the place where Jesus fell with his cross. This is the place where Jesus fell with his cross. This is the place where Jesus fell with his cross. And uh, just, you know, it was about a group of about 30. And then after the last person, I just started weeping, and it just like something beyond words just overcame me. Uh, I sort of realized where I was, what had happened, and just Jesus' love for me, you know, and his sorrow. Um, really can't explain it. Um, I had never like I'd really never cried like that in my life before. It was something it was like something opened in my heart in that moment, um, and thankfully. It, another person in the group also was crying. So she and I were kind of walking, you know, the way of sorrow together. And then until we got to the Holy Sepulchre, uh, where Jesus was crucified, and then we kind of calmed down there. Um, but I think before I knew I had the Catholic idea of pilgrimage, I think that just showed me the power of being in a particular place where something significant happened. Um, and even here in Pittsburgh, I'll make little pilgrimages um, for example, the day I decided to become Catholic, I remember exactly where I was on a trail in Ch Chenley Park in Oakland. And I'll go back to that spot on the anniversary of that day and just kind of read my journal from that day and pray through that again and remember why I decided to become Catholic and thank God for that moment. Um, so I encourage you, even you can make li these little local pilgrimages and it's a really powerful kind of prayer experience. Um, so with that in mind, this trip really was a pilgrimage. Um, and the first day I was there, I was kind of, you know, like, why am I here? You know, I, I don't know if you ever have, like, on vacation even, you, you kind of takes a little bit to get into it. It's like, why am I doing this, you know? Um, and so the, 
really, I think the original reason was this sort of Holy Communion. Um, <clears throat> there's a really good group of people on the trip. So uh, you can see it from this picture. It was uh, 11 men and a monk, basically. So uh, there's 11 seminarians. Um, so there's, you can see me in the middle. And then Brian Myler, he's from, uh, he's from Plum, but right now he's on pastoral year at uh, St. Aidan's. So you might see him around there. And then uh, John Ferguson, Deacon John Ferguson, he's becoming ordained a priest uh, this coming June. And so us three are from Pittsburgh. Uh, these two guys are from Erie, really good friends of mine. And uh, it, yeah, just a great group. Brother Gilbert in the back, uh, he is a, he's a monk and my classmate. So um, it was just a great group going together. And yeah, this is Father Boniface Hicks. So he was the monk who led our pilgrimage uh, from St. Vincent Seminary. So uh, we're all together at St. Vincent Seminary, but sometimes you you just share an experience together and then you sort of bond over that. Um, but then also, like I said, holy places and then holy people. So walking the footsteps of where the saints had walked and so many people had passed to, like into and out of Rome and all these events there. So, um, and then what most people ask about is, did I see the Pope? So <laughs> the answer is yes, but from kind of far away. So uh, this is at the Sunday Angelus. So there's two sort of general audiences he has a week. Uh, and one is on Sunday at noon. Uh, he has a short message to the world, and then, he, then we pray an Angelus together. So uh, like the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, which you can see by the Holy Spirit. And we pray the Hail Mary. Um, and he prayed that in Latin. So I at least knew the Ave Maria in Latin. So we could all join that. And that was kind of special, just being with people from all over the world, uh, praying together, and this uh, prayer of the church with uh, with our Holy Father, you know. Um, and then this was on Wednesday, the Wednesday audience. We got there two and a half hours early. We got a good seat. And uh, he, the first thing is the Pope comes around in his Pope mobile, and he, he greets people. He blesses them. Uh, so this picture kind of looks like he's looking at our group. So it was cool. Uh, we were blessed by the Pope, and um, and then he had a he gave a audience, but he wasn't feeling well. He had a cold, so he had somebody else read the audience. Uh, and he's been doing a series on vices and virtues. So this this uh, two weeks ago, this was a uh, uh, on the vice of pride. Um, so it's a really good audience. I I recommend reading it. You can find it on the Vatican website. Um, so kind of another question I was thinking about, especially with becoming Catholic, was why is Rome the center of the Catholic Church? And like you would think from the Bible, it would be Jerusalem, because that's where the church started. That's where Jesus' death, you know, passion, death, and resurrection, Pentecost, um, all those things. So uh, I was thinking about this during the trip, and there's a couple different answers. Um, so one it's just when you look at the last 2,000 years in God's providence, um, Jerusalem over here is on a little strip of land between three continents, and there's a desert to the east. So whenever kingdoms pass through to go to another continent, they always pass through Israel. And so that's why all through history, Jerusalem's been taken over time and time again. Um, whereas Rome, geographically, is... You know, nobody passes through there on their way to anywhere else. And it's, you know, surrounded mostly by water. And it's just a lot more secure of a, an area. Um, and so Rome's really only been attacked a, a few times in 2,000 years. Whereas Jerusalem, there's been a lot of rise and fall, different uh, kingdoms, nations owning Jerusalem. So, um, so God's providence, I think, brought the church to Rome. And that's been a stable place for the headquarters, so to speak. Um, the second reason is sort of biblically. So if you've read through the book of Acts, it, you know, it, it starts in Jerusalem. It goes to Samaria, some other countries, and then the ends of the earth. And it ends up in Rome. And so the last chapter of Acts sort of ends abruptly. All of a sudden, it's uh, Paul is preaching in Rome. And then he is in prison for two years. And then it just ends. And you're like, well, what happens next? It's not a very good ending, you know. <laughs> so, but I think it's 
you know, the Holy Spirit's providence, whether or not that was just the present day when the book was written, or uh, I think the Holy Spirit is showing us that the rest of the story continues from Rome then on. Um, and then the third major reason is uh, Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome, and they're the two pillars of the church. So, um, and that that's not in the Bible, so sometimes Protestants debate whether that happened in Rome. Um, but we see from some of the church fathers, the earliest writings after uh, the Bible, as early as you know, 105 AD, St. Ignatius of Antioch, he's a bishop. He's on his way to actually be martyred in Rome, and he writes seven letters to other churches. And he says to the church holding chief place, which is Rome. Um, and so this early in the church, there is a preeminence of Rome among all the other churches and bishops. And then... St. Clement, even earlier, in 96 AD, he's talking about Roman martyrs, and he mentions Peter and Paul. Uh, that's, it's still in the first century. And then Irenaeus writes around 180 AD, and this was a quote that really spoke to me when I was, uh, I think right before I decided to convert, I read this quote, and it's, it says, it is possible then for everyone in every church who may wish to know the truth. It's like, I do. I want to know. I was wrestling with what is the true church? Like, is which denomination who has the truth? Um, he says, we, have, we contemplate the tradition of the apostles, which has been made known throughout the whole world. And the word Catholic actually means universal. Uh, that's the origin of that word. And by those who were instituted bishops by the apostles and their successors to our own times. And then he specifically mentions the uh, bishops of Rome. So he goes in sequence. He says Peter, Linus, Anacletus, and Clement. And then Clement's who we just heard from before. So from the early days, they really focused on the bishops of Rome having a preeminence. And then uh, Eusebius, he's the first church historian. Uh, so he writes the whole history of the church from Jesus Christ himself up until his day in about 324 A.D. And he says uh, Paul was beheaded in Rome and Peter was crucified. He says they were martyred at the same time. Uh, that is debated, uh, but that's, that's what he claims. And then he also uh, talks about Peter asked to be crucified head downward uh, because he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Um, so pretty early testimonies of and why, why Rome is so important. Uh, so Rome today, um, when people ask, you know, what did you do in Rome? It's pretty much, we, most of our times we're in churches. So it makes sense, you're, you know, your group of seminarians going to Rome. So, um, but what, what really f shocked me was uh, Rome has over 900 churches in one city. So that just kind of blew me away. And when we saw that, because... Uh, on our way to go to one basilica, we'd find three or four churches along the way and just kind of stop in and poke our head in. And then every church is just overwhelming. It's so beautiful. So kind of to give an overview of the trip, I thought I'd talk about each of the four major basilicas. These are the most important churches in Rome. Uh, and the first one is St. Peter's Basilica. So this is the the church, you know, um, and what's cool is, I don't know if you've ever thought about how this looks from above, but you see there's St. Peter's Square, which isn't really a square, it's more like an oval. Um, but if you notice, anyone know what kind of shape that makes? Like arms. Yeah, so arms, prayer hands. So it looks like a keyhole. Mm -hmm. And so it's like St. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really powerful symbol. Or it could even look like a key if you add the church onto it. Right. Um, and so that's, and then someone else said arms, and so kind of from the side, it does look like, it's like the, out of the church is coming these two arms that, like, are open to the whole world. It's like, because the church is, uh, it said the church is the only organization that doesn't exist for itself. Like, we aim to evangelize the whole world and share the good news, um, so that everyone can come, you know, and be saved and journey with us to heaven. So... And then uh, along the top of the, the arms, so to speak, there's uh, 140 saint statues. And they're, they're really big, but 
from the ground. They looked small. And uh, it's just amazing. I, I wrote down, I got the list of all these saints. And so it'd be something to just, you know, you could spend a year just studying saint by saint. Uh, some of them we know, like, you know, St. Anthony or St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, but a lot of them, you might not know them. So, so it's, uh, it's just an amazing thing. So when we, we visited, we got there early in the morning before the audience. Um, and then when you head into St. Peter's, it's just uh, overwhelming. Uh, it's so big, and you see the people on the bottom. Just they look like ants, you know. <laughs> it's just everything's, like, blown up, like 10x. And um, the letters that you see on the top, uh, under the dome in the back, each of the letters is six feet tall. Uh, so it's pretty incredible. And then this is a uh, this is a layout of St. Peter's, and then to the right is just a general map of a basilica. So I don't know if you've ever, uh, you probably know some of these words, like the nave is the main body of the church, and then the transept is the part that crosses, and the apse is the very back of the church. And these, uh, and this, the, the design of a basilica was actually taken over from uh, the Roman emperors. So the emperor would sit here, and people would come to him, and he would judge their cases. Uh, it's sort of it's sort of like a courtroom or the place where government business happened. You know, they'd have meetings. The side chapels were kind of like meeting rooms or lesser courts. And then when, uh, with Emperor Constantine in the 300s, when Rome became when the Roman Empire became Christianized, then these basilicas were instead of being like government buildings or pagan temples, they were Christianized. So we took the same layout, and it just happens to be in the shape of a cross. So that works well. Uh, and then ever since, we've been uh, using basilicas. And, uh, so, and what's amazing, too, is uh, someone explained to me, when we go up to receive communion in this kind of church, uh, you know, people form lines down the middle, and then they go back through the sides. And so on this cross shape, we actually become like the corpus on the cross. And so the people's, our bodies make up the body of Christ as we receive the body of Christ, you know. And so it's just, that just blows my mind, you know. Like from above, it's like we are becoming the body of Christ in so many levels. Um, so that's just a cool aspect of a basilica. And then the, uh, I think it's called the Baldacchino over the altar. Uh, it was under construction while we were there, unfortunately. But it, what's kind of cool is uh, the global like Knights of Columbus are helping fund this. They're like the big funders. So I thought that was kind of cool, like the impact of that, you know, American organization is covering the altar, you know, of the holiest church. So. And then the back, I always love that in the apse, it's a window of the Holy Spirit as a dove. And that's just, to me, that's just a beautiful symbol of we're in the age of the Holy Spirit who is guiding the church. And, uh, you know, we all need to have a stronger devotion to the Holy Spirit, just, you know, guiding us day by day. And the beautiful, like, angels surrounding, I think Bernini was the sculptor behind that. And so I remember seeing things like this um, the first time I went to Rome. I just really asked, like, why, you know, why is the church so rich? Why is it so lavishly decorated? And, like, why aren't they using that money to, you know, feed the poor or evangelize? Um, but really, I think now I understand, uh, like, first of all, it's very biblical. Like, you see all throughout the Bible, God wants us to build a temple that is glorious to honor him, you know? It's like, don't we want the most beautiful building on earth to be for God, you know? And then... uh and secondly, it, it is evangelizing people. So, like, there's so many people come and visit St. Peter's and are just in awe, and it just leads them to God, that sort of awe of beauty. Um, so those are kind of the two things I think about where, yeah, we should, you know, of course, everything in balance. You don't want to put your entire budget to church artwork, but um, we do want to, it, it should be the most beautiful building in the area, you know.
And then I always remember to look up in these churches because it's just so beautiful, the domes and there's murals on the top. And then so here is uh, St. Peter's tomb. And so a lot of these basilicas, there's sort of this circular area right in front of the altar. And then it goes down. There's staircases down. And, uh, and then there it's, you can see it's the uh, um, body of Peter. And then this is on the second, the crypt level below. Um, it says the sep sepulcher of uh, St. Peter the Apostle. Um, and I think there's another level below this uh, where if you do go to Rome, you want to try to, like a year in advance, you can book these Favi tour tickets. And you go like into the catacombs below St. Peter's. Um, but you have to book it like nine months to a year in advance. So just a tip if you ever plan a trip. And then on the crypt level, there's also the tomb of Pope Benedict XVI. Um, so we're able to pray there. Um, and then here's uh, St. John Paul II, uh, his tomb. And he was such, he's so important in my vocation. Uh, I've, I read part of the biography by George Weigel. And even just reading about his early life and how he, he loved like camping, the outdoors, he loved to ski. He would take groups on camping trips and retreats and things like that. And so I just really connected with him. His love of the arts, like poetry, theater, and uh, but yet his, yeah, he studied philosophy. So just a real Renaissance man. And then as a pope, he like helped tear down the Iron Curtain. And he went to Poland and a third of the country was there when he talked. Like, so just incredible. Uh, Incredible man, incredible saint. And then this was another thing I sort of wrestled with my first visit. I was like, why do we, they put all these bodies on display? It's so weird. Like, <laughs> they just put them in a glass case. And, um, and so the, I think now I understand, like, as Catholics, we really have a reverence for the body, and especially the bodies of saints. You know, we have relics and... Um, and then some saints are incorrupt or partially incorrupt. So it just shows how Christ's resurrection power extends even to, you know, us human beings um, and those who became very holy in this life. Yeah, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes there's really like just a covering over the bones, but then other times the body is incorrupt. So it, it's, it can be hard to tell sometimes. Um, and there'll be some more pictures um and then there, here's the side chapel where the tabernacle is um and so we had we had mass in the crypt below um on friday morning and then with uh uh father boniface celebrating and and then we actually had an hour up in saint peter's before the tourists came in so i was able to just pray a holy hour in saint peter's which that was just like such a grace you know and um but in a way, it's like I realize, like how blessed we are to have Jesus in the tabernacle, he, you know, here in Pittsburgh and in our parish. So, uh, just sometimes you go far away to realize what you have at home, you know. So that was a special time, and this is the chapel of Saint Joseph, um, who we celebrate tonight and tomorrow. Um, but he, uh, I thought that was very, very fitting because he's the unit universal guardian and protector of the church and so he's like guarding jesus in the tabernacle and uh but then he, he looks kind of angry or something in this <laughs> icon so i don't know what that's about but <laughs> that's saint joseph all right so the second major basilica is uh, saint john lateran there's actually a feast day for this church so if you go to daily mass you might i forget what day it is but um it's because this is the Pope's parish church, basically. Um, this is and this is his cathedral, so it's where he has his cathedra, which means chair. Um, and so this this church we all celebrate it every year because it's uh, it's also our parish because the Pope is all our, it's, it's our Papa, you know. So we we belong to this church as well. And then again, you go in and it's just overwhelming. It's beautiful. Um, and there's statues of the 12 apostles. And then there's the cathedra, 
um, the Pope's chair. And then in the middle, sort of over that sort of crypt area, there's uh, the heads of Peter and Paul um, in this church. So it's like the two pillars, like his body's in St. Peter's, and then it, his head is here. So um, it's just amazing. You can't, you can't see it super well, but they're up there, what I'm told. So <laughs> yeah, you can watch over the church. And, and then they're just, the apse usually has a beautiful artwork in that sort of half dome area. And you have Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, you have John, uh, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul, and then usually there's Andrew, because he's the one who led Peter to Jesus. So they always honor Andrew. Without Andrew, you wouldn't have Peter. So, yeah. Oh, whoops. And then they're the biggest tabernacle I've ever seen. It's like a little house. <laughs> so, and just looking back down, and then. What's cool is you'll see a lot of the, you get to know the iconography when you're in Rome because you start to say, who's that saint? Um, so Peter always has his keys. Uh, Paul has his sword, like the sword is the word of God. Um, and he was also beheaded. So he, they usually carry the instrument of their martyrdom. Like St. Andrew has his X-shaped cross. And then the, the one who looks the youngest is usually St. John. John the Apostle, um, because he lived, it said, until the 90s AD, so he must have been young in the 30s when Jesus' ministry was. Does anyone know who's holding his skin? St. Bartholomew, so, or Nathaniel. Um, he, uh, he was skinned alive, so it's kind of gruesome, but, but it's like these instruments of martyrdom become signs of victory because it shows the power of Christ in them. And then holding his book is uh, St. Matthew, so gospel writer. So I, I just love these statues. It's, you know, these are things that you can just meditate on and like maybe decorate your home or something. And uh, kind of throughout the whole trip, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of like the relics of these saints, which I look up to, and I kind of felt really close to them. And, had these sort of prayerful moments, just praying in front of their relics and their, their bodies. Um, and just, I was praying and in that holy hour in St. Peter's, it just really struck me like how each, you know, God is like the light, you know, John's gospel starts out, you know, the light has come to the earth and we don't, we don't recognize him. Um, but then each of the saints are like rays of light almost from God. And we reflect God in different ways. Um, and I just, I was sort of challenged because I was like, oh, I don't feel like I could ever be a St. Ignatius of Loyola or, you know, St. Paul or, but then I felt like the saints were encouraging me, like, you're called to be Eric, you know, even if, you know, St. Francis of Assisi was you, you'd be a different St. Francis, you know, so, um, and then just being, you know, being surrounded by the, like these tour guides all the time and things like that. They tell these stories over and over, the saints. And it's, you know, it's like what stories will be told about, like, my life and, like, my friends and my family. Um, and it's like even if it's hidden in this life and it's never known, uh, Jesus says nothing will be hidden that will not be revealed. But sometimes I think, like, heaven, you know, the first thousand years or whatever will just be, like, sharing stories, you know, just hearing all the beautiful hidden stories of all these hidden saints that, and all these connections we never knew about. Um, and I'm just sort of in awe of that, you know. And so St. Paul, also a huge, he's a patron of our diocese, and he's been an important saint for me. Um, again, a huge basilica. We actually walked the wrong way to get in, so we ended up walking all the way around. <laughs> it took like 10 minutes. I was like, this is bigger than the Amazon warehouse. But <laughs> Um, and so you walk in, it's just really huge. And then on the top, lining the top wall is uh, each of the popes, the, each of the bishops of Rome. So it starts with uh, St. Peter here, and uh, Linus, Cletus, Clement, as we saw before. And then it goes all the way to Pope Francis, like 260-something. Yeah, 67, 66. And uh, 
So I, I was kind of concerned. I was like, is there only going to be one more pope? And then somebody said, no, there's some more on the other wall. So we got some space. And then above are images of Paul's life. So we know so much about Paul's life from Scripture, um, almost more than any other characters in the Bible, maybe like Moses and David, but um, there's like 40 images of Paul's life. So I was trying to figure out, you know, what each one was. So there's his, he was at the stoning of St. Stephen, and then there's his conversion moment on the road to Damascus. Uh, Ananias opening his eyes after he was blind, Ananias baptizing him. Uh, and then on the right, he's escaping in a basket out of a, a city. So just really incredible life. Uh, here's the apse sort of dome. And I just really liked uh, the face of Christ in this dome. Right? Like he just has a very gentle yet very present and intense gaze. And a lot of icons, you can sort of get lost in them. You just contemplate the faces and the hands and the the way their body's positioned. Um, so it's just beautiful. And then there's uh, Christ on this this one sort of in front is sort of more of a judgment Jesus. Uh, so it's sort of an image of justice and mercy. They both go together. So um, there's always that call to repentance. Um, but thankfully, you know, we have a faith of new beginnings. So we're always beginning again, uh, repenting. And then below the apps on the wall, there in the apps, there's a list of names from around 1850 when they rededicated this basilica and of all the bishops who were there. And kind of three lines up from my finger, there's a Michael O'Connor, Bishop of Pittsburgh. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. There's like Pittsburgh on the wall in this basilica. Um, and he's our, you know, St. Paul's our patron. So it's kind of fitting. And then in that sort of area in the center where you go down, there's the body of St. Paul. And above is a chain with, with which Paul was bound when he was in prison. And that was significant because even in Paul's letters, he says, remember my chains. Uh, he says, I, I bear these chains for Christ. Um, so it was a powerful moment. And then uh, as I was praying here, I kind of received a word of, I felt like St. Paul was helping me think of all the gifts God's given me. Um, and like I had a career in software engineering and, uh, I know sign language from growing up being, having hearing loss and, um, and all these different desires that I have too. And sometimes you compare yourself to the saints and it's like, I couldn't be you, St. Paul, you know, but I felt like St. Paul was telling me like, you have all these gifts and desires and the Lord will use them all if you let him. Um, and just him encouraging me, consoling me in that way. Uh, so you never know because Paul, like one point in his life, he was a murderer. He was killing Christians. And then today we don't call him that. We call him saint. So you never know what can happen in a lifetime. Uh, and then we, we had mass in a side chapel, uh, the chapel of, uh, Benedict. So it was, it was fitting being with a group of, you know, seminarians from Benedictine seminary. Right. The fourth basilica, St. Mary Major, so this is one of the earliest uh, Marian churches, and it's soon after the Council of Ephesus, where they said that we, we can call Mary the mother of God. It's not blasphemous, you know, like we really can call her in a sense, mother of God. And that's the view of the church. And then when you go down into the crypt, I didn't know what was here, so it's kind of a surprise. I sort of knelt down and I was like, what is this? You know, and it's the wood from Christ's crib when he was born in Bethlehem and he was laid in a manger. And so they have the wood uh, from his from his crib, uh, which is just I was like, wow, they have that, you know. <laughs> so it's just a powerful moment. And that same day we saw to the pillar on which Christ was bound and scourged. So I was just thinking about, like, from the crib to the pillar, you know, just the power of all that Christ went through. And then in a side chapel, 
there's an ancient icon of Mary and the Christ child. And some say this goes all the way back to St. Luke. And the, uh, not this image, but not the actual painting, but the image. And that, I just, you know, sort of got lost in this icon too. You know, sometimes Mary doesn't look happy, but she's always full of grace. So it's like, what is she thinking about, you know? And then she, Mary's kind of blessing in this. She has two fingers out. Um, so it's an interesting image there. All right, so we've covered the four major basilicas, and then I'm going to talk about the two day trips we did. Um, and Assisi was really significant to me. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi is my confirmation saint. And so I have a special devotion to him. He helped me come into the Catholic Church. And uh, I was like, and th so this is Assisi, a little medieval town. Now has this huge basilica in front. <laughs> this is a gate entrance. And just all these little winding roads, you know, little, uh, yeah, little winding roads. And then this is, this is the Basilica of St. Clair. And then there's St. Clair. So, th so she, this isn't like her, her bones are sort of behind this. Um, so she's no longer incorrupt. But it was like 600 years after she died, they brought up her body. Uh, they sort of found it on, you know, and then. She was incorrupt after 600 years. It was just her skin had blackened a little bit, but her skin was still there, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so then, but then slowly after that, she started decaying. But so they kind of remember that with the sort of wax figure, just the mirac the miracle of that. And and Saint Clair was with Saint Francis, and she started the Poor Clares. She wanted to get involved with St. Francis. And then they have some of the original habits that Francis and Claire wore, which is really cool. They're pretty short. Like, Francis might have only been, like, 4 foot 10 or something. It's, yeah, really short. And then here, there's a side chapel where it's the cross of San Damiano. And this was a cross where St. Francis, when he was in a rough part of his life, um, his military career had just failed, um, and he was praying before this, asking God, like, your will be done. Like, whatever you want, just tell me. And he heard Jesus speak from the cross, saying, Francis, rebuild my church. You can see that it has fallen to ruin. And at the church at that time uh, was really corrupt. There's a lot of uh, scandal among the priests and bishops and a big loss of the faith among the faithful. and But Francis thought he just meant, like, build my stone church. So he started gathering stones, and uh, eventually, you know, he figured out, like, God was calling him to something greater. So, uh, but he started stealing money from his father, who was a successful cloth merchant, and he would buy things for the church and feed the poor. Uh, and then his father actually, so this is the cross, um, and then this is the church over the St. Francis's home where he grew up. And his father locked him up in his home <laughs> because he, you know, just needed to contain him. Stop stealing from me, son. You know, and this is this this is the the cage that he was locked in. Um, and then eventually, his father took Francis to the bishop and said, like, what do I do, bishop? Like. And St. Francis, like, took off his clothes. He gave them to his father and said, that nothing I have is yours. I now, like, give myself to the church and to, to Christ. And the bishop clothed him <laughs> and then, like, you know, brought him in. And then, like, St. Francis went off into the woods and started living as a, as a hermit. And slowly people started to gather around him. And that started the Franciscan order which is spread over the whole globe and, you know, converted entire countries to the faith. So uh, it's incredible. And then here, here I am in the, this is a place where it said St. Francis was born. It said he was born with the animals, uh, kind of like Christ uh, was born in the stable. So um, I think more than anyone else, uh, there's this biography I read, uh, 
G.K. Chesterton uh, about St. Francis of Assisi. It's just a great book. And he talks about how almost like nobody else is more, has been more like Christ than St. Francis in 2,000 years of the church's history, even to receiving the wounds of Christ in his own body and his stigmata. Yeah. I have some pictures of food, too. So <laughs> this was lunch in Assisi. It's really great. I think Kava Tapi or something like that. And we had wine every day, you know. It was great. And this is the Basilica of St. Francis. So we had Mass in a side chapel there. And then, uh, and then we went down uh, and saw St. Francis' tomb. And this was kind of the most powerful part of the trip for me. Um, if you listen to any of my prayer talks from last year, you know that I love to just journal when I pray. And so some of these places I was like journaling and kind of, I sort of imagine like a dialogue with the saint, you know, or with Jesus himself. And, um, and here I just, I was not expecting it, but sort of overwhelmed by a sense of St. Francis's presence. Um, and I felt like he was saying, like he just delighted in that I picked him as my confirmation saint. You know, he was delighting in me. And like, oh, like I never thought of a saint could do that, you know. <laughs> and um and then he was just encouraging me with different words like, um, let love compel you forward. She will not fail you, nor lady poverty. Remain poor in spirit and rich in love. Remind yourself where true wealth is found, an imitation of Christ. Allow yourself to be wounded by love of him. Allow yourself to become a holy fool. Uh, stay close to friends. The unity you seek for, taste through friendship. And just all these like overwhelming, just overwhelmed by like, you know, and a lot of these places it's like, okay, you have 10 minutes, you know. But then it just all of a sudden it was like, boom, I was in this like prayerful state and um, it was really special. And uh, at the end, I realized um, when he was starting the Franciscan order and all that, like St. Francis was just looking for friends. Like he wanted friends who he could journey to God with, you know, and live the Christian life and have that brotherhood. So I just really like resonated with that. You know, and even Jesus himself, like he wants us to be friends, have that intimacy with him. So this is a powerful moment there. And yeah, so like saints, friends with me, delighting in me. There's that icon there of the stigmata. It is so powerful. And then I talked about, yeah, each of the saints are unique radiances of God. Um, and then also, yeah, I've, I've heard it said just the word glory, we tend to think of like, you know, God appearing on the mountain to Moses and there's thunderstorms and earthquakes. But really, when you, real glory is uh, interpersonal relationship. It's whatever makes you go, whoa. And like, that's what glory is. And when you have those moments in a relationship where, like, you see a part of someone that you've never seen before, and you're like, whoa, you know, or someone's delighting in you, and your heart is, like, just grows a little bit, like, that, that's really true glory. Um, and there's a lot of false glory in the world where we might look at, like, beautiful people or beautiful things, or, um, but we don't have a relationship with these people or, like, celebrities or... We don't have a real relationship with these things that we desire, um, and they don't last. So um, I was thinking about that, just the glory of the saints. It's all about relationship, and that's what, that's what we're called to. The, even God himself in Trinity is a relationship. Uh, and so, you know, all the way back from Peter, but then in Assisi is also Carlo Acutis. Uh, he was just beatified recently. He was born in 1990. And he died in 2006. And he, uh, as a teenager, you know, he played Nintendo 64. Uh, with, he played soccer, and, you know. But then uh, he also made a website of Eucharistic Miracles. 
and he, his family was pretty well off, so he would take food to the homeless and the poor and like bring sleeping bags, like new sleeping bags to them. And he's like, I'm not giving the poor leftovers. I want them to have the same food that I have, you know. And, and then he, he got leukemia when he was 15 or 16, and he said, I want to offer my sufferings for the Holy Father and for the church. And so just this incredible, you know, 15-year-old. And uh, today his body is in a CC, and it's uh, partially incorrupt. And they sort of have a partially waxed, you know, but still very intact, which is miraculous. And he's wearing sweatshirt and blue jeans and, like, tennis shoes. So it's just, like, such a relatable saint, you know. He was born in the same decade as me. He's already made it to heaven. <laughs> And so just, like, we don't have to wait to just receive God's gifts, receive his love, and just live that. So that's powerful. All right, so Subiaco was another day trip. And this, you might not have heard of this place. So this is where another, like, hillside town in Italy. Um, But this is where St. Benedict, he actually left Rome. He was from a well-off family, had a great education. But then God was calling him to something more. And uh, he, he went out into the wilderness, and he, like, hid in this cave for three years. And it was in Subiaco. Um, he was just praying, discerning the Lord's will. And then this other monk, I think Morris, uh, would lower him bread on a ba- in a basket because you couldn't even walk to this cave. It was, like, just in the side of the mountain. So... Today, there's a monastery built into the side of the mountain, and uh, Benedictines are still there. And it's just a beautiful, like, he picked an awesome spot. Like, (laughs) just natural beauty there. It was a beautiful day when we were there. So we walk up the hill, and then we get to this monastery. It's overlook. There's me and my friend Michael. And, uh... The tour guide was from Subiaco. She grew up there, so it was kind of a cool tour. Um, and then in one of the icons in there, you see you actually see the monastery in the background. Um, and so it's almost like a snapshot of the past. And you can see there's like a drawbridge on the left. Um, so they used to like pull the drawbridge up and down. It's uh, pretty good security. And then there's a there's amazing like chapel or just this church that just keeps going down and down, um, like built into the mountain. And I love medieval artwork. There's just so many faces and characters, and um, here is uh, the Palm Sunday, and you see the little kids climbing the trees to get more palms. (laughs) So, like, you can see almost all of salvation history just in these murals. Like, here is the kiss of Judas, um, and then there's the scourging of the pillar, there's a crucifixion, and there's even multiple scenes on the bottom, like different characters. And then here's the resurrection appearances, Mary Magdalene on the bottom left, and then the 12 apostles, the ascension. Uh, and then even, Rev- I like this, the book of Revelation. It talks about a sword coming out of Christ's mouth, and you usually don't see that depicted. Or also the resurrection of the dead on the right. And then... They, they really were into memento mori, remember your death. Uh, it's a very um, profitable thing to every day just remember that you will die someday and how do I live today in light of that. Um, but it's almost comical, like they have speech bubbles almost. Yeah. And I think this guy is talking about his death as he's getting stabbed by the skeleton. So, <laughs> And then they even show like how a body decays. It's like... Remember that this will happen to you. Like, take care of your soul, you know. There's this little peak window, and there's the, the devil. is You can, like, peek at the devil through this window. <laughs> but he's not allowed in the church. <laughs> and then here's showing the bread, the cave where St. Benedict was. And then the, the crow is often with St. Benedict, like on the St. Benedict medal, if you've seen that. And it's because uh, monks didn't like, he was very strict with discipline. The rule of St. Benedict is, you know, the ancient monastic rule. Uh, but the other monks tried to poison him. And they gave him poison bread, but then 
the crow took it away. So, <laughs> and then here is the actual cave where Saint Benedict was for three years, uh, praying, discerning God's will, and um, so we were able to pray there a little bit, and then sort of touch, you know, touch the cave. And I have some blessed items here, and they they were touched to the cave, you know, where Saint Benedict was. And then there's some other depictions of Saint Benedict's life. And a good good meal, <laughs> yeah. Um, so just uh, to wrap up, I'll talk about some some little spiritual takeaways as well. Um, so there's like these three women who I kept coming back to. There's different statues. Um, one is uh, Teresa of Avila. It's the Transverberation by Brunini, and I don't know if you've ever seen this sculpture. But it's just, it really, more than any other piece of art, I think it shows contemplation, what, what contemplative prayer, like experience, experiencing ecstasies in prayer, uh, what that's like. And um, just this angel, like gently with like two fingers, is like going to pierce her heart, you know, with love. And she's just like, if you just look at her face, it's just uh, beyond words, you know, what she's experiencing. Um, and so that's sort of like the immense joy and grace that we can have in prayer, almost wounded in love. And then there's the famous Pieta, uh, you know, the Blessed Mother holding the body of her son, uh, and just the deep sorrow, the grief. Um, what I never realized before was Mary is almost larger than life. Um, like, she's not really to scale. And then, um, like, she's a lot younger than she should be because her son is, you know, 33. And, but it really just shows almost the state of her soul. Like, my soul magnifies the Lord. And she's become bigger and sort of has that eternal youth of, uh, like, God who is ever new, you know. Um, there's so many things here. And then the third woman is uh, St. Cecilia, who we often think of with music. Um, but... Hers is another story where um, they opened her tomb after centuries, and this is what her body looked like. It was, like, completely intact, but she was kind of in this pose that's, like, I don't know. It's just sort of a meditative, like, you know, her face is turned. There's sort of a hidden, um, it's like we don't get to see her full beauty, but she also looks, like, peaceful at the same time, um, so, but she almost looked bound, like she was, you know, dragged to her death. So, there's a lot of like overlapping things just in this. It's very powerful. So it's like the, you know, the glory of ecstasy, the depths of sorrow, and then this sort of like peace, hiddenness with death. And I just kind of contemplating all those. Um, we also got to see the Caravaggio's, the calling of Matthew, as in one of the churches. Uh, this famous painting, and I was just thinking, you know, all these experiences, like, it's like, God, are you really calling me, like these saints, you know, are you calling me to live this adventure um, in my own way? And then another powerful moment is the Basilica of St. Philip and James, and again, you go to this little crypt part, and you go down, and then I just really, this is another moment I was overwhelmed where I just felt like Philip and James were like right, like it's almost like their hands were on my shoulders. And Philip famously asks like Jesus on the night of the Last Supper, um, he's like, show us the Father. He has this great desire. And then Jesus says, like, Philip, have you been with me so long and yet you do not know me? And so like just that like grief, but also the Lord wants me to know him, that invitation. So... I felt I've meditated on that a lot, and I felt like Philip was encouraging me. Um, like, there's so much more to know. You, it's like you really don't even know the beginning of who Jesus is. Um, just these lowly like fishermen beca became apostles to the whole world. So, and then one last thing: there's a church with the relics of the Passion. Uh, they're in this glass case, and here they have a nail from the cross. Um, and there's like nobody in this chapel. There's maybe like four people, 
And so you get, I just went up close and just knelt there and was like, this was the nail that like bore the sacred weight of Jesus, you know, and just, and on the top it looks, it's, it's dull. And I just thought about like, you know, the force which that went in and just, you know, just thinking about the power of, yeah, his, his love and taking that nail for me. And, um, yeah, it's amazing that we have that. And you just kneel in front of it. And um, and then they also have the plaque where it's Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, I-N-R-I. And they have that. I was like, oh, my goodness. Like St. Helen brought it from Jerusalem to Rome. And nobody's there. Yeah. So just to see that. And then the sacred languages. It said that Hebrew, Greek, and Latin were kind of made holy by this piece of wood. Um the languages of scripture and the languages of the church. Um, so it's a powerful thing. Um, so just kind of, oh, yeah, there's some friends from Pittsburgh. <laughs> Sunday Mass, I was sitting across from someone I was in RCI with at the oratory in Pittsburgh. I was like, I didn't know you were in Rome. <laughs> and then she was the lector. I was like, okay. And then the con celebrating priest is from Pittsburgh, the Father Tom. So, uh, and then, uh, Another group from St. Vincent also went at the same time. We had celebrated Mass with them. And this is the last picture, just us on our way to St. Peter's. So, um, yeah, so just to sum up, I like hope, to, I hope that shares some of the graces of the trip. And uh, especially, I think, just the spiritual, you know, encounters with the saints. And I hope that's what you can take away. Um, and... You know, again, sometimes we go far away to realize what we have at home. And God is calling each of us in our unique ways. We have everything we need to become a saint. It's just our receptivity and cooperation with God's grace. So that's my that's my prayer for you all. And thank you for all the, your support. I definitely felt your prayers because I was super awake the whole trip when I definitely shouldn't have been. Uh, so that was like I, I 100% knew, like, I had 100 people I knew of who were praying for me, and I'm sure m- many more. Uh, and I, I totally felt those prayers. Uh, one of the seminarians almost died in crossing the street, but he fell, he actually fell into a rotted tree stump. And that sort of saved him. So I was like, there's some prayers. Like, <laughs> um, So everything went really smoothly. Like all our, none of our flights were delayed, which is a miracle today. And... Uh, so I really know I felt so supported and loved, and I hope that I can just share all that with you. So um, thanks for being here, and I'll, I'll close with a quick prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for continuing to call us deeper, uh, and further up and further into your sacred mysteries. Um, I pray that all of us would Embrace the call to become saints and to um, that you would raise up new uh, St. Francis's, new Benedict's, uh, new Peter's and Paul's to um, call the entire world to know you and to love you. Um, pray that you uh, just pour, continue to pour out your grace, uh, all the graces from this talk and from this trip, uh, and bless our parish and our church and our world. Um, We ask the intercession of all the saints, but especially our lead and exemplar in our Mother Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Peter and Paul, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. All the saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.